Okay, I think I'm going to get going. Hi, everyone. My name is Rick Manning. I'm the executive director of the Friends of Stewart Park. We have many people joining us, um, but I do have a, <clears throat> as we go here, but I have a few introductory comments that I'm just going to start making. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you. Wish me luck. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you about a few things that we have going on over the next month or so, and then I'll introduce our speaker, Mary Ellen LeMay. Um, so thank you all for coming, and I will thank you all again in just a moment. Uh, the Friends of Stewart Park, as most of you know, is uh, our mission is to enhance and revitalize Stewart Park, and recently the Cuga Waterfront Trail as well, in partnership with the city of Ithaca, for the enjoyment of Ithaca residents and visitors to our community. <clears throat> we have um, one of our favorite events of the year, uh, particularly if the weather isn't terrible. It often is though, um, as many of you know who come. Um, and we will be making a, an announcement probably tomorrow or Friday if we think we need to postpone it until the 8th, which is our rain date. But um, we're hopeful to go on. Some of the things we'll be doing is cleaning up the water edge is a very popular one. Um, a new pathway that was just put in December actually with the Rotary Club. I went down today to have a look. The playground is full of people. It's very exciting. I was shocked actually. Um, kids everywhere playing. Uh, this is about four o'clock this afternoon. And this is um, those of you that saw some of the colorful pictures from past summers. Um, We'll be shocked to see what it looks like now. We do leave everything um, um, uncut during the winter just for um, to keep food, seeds, and <clears throat> foliage available for birds and bugs and wildlife. Um, now is the time to trim it, and that's what we'll be doing a lot of this, uh, this weekend. Um, so Janelle, I am having this issue of having a challenging time advancing when people join, but that's okay. Uh, we'll be working at the trailhead um, in Stewart Park. We'll be working all along the trail in Stewart Park at the small um, beds between the trail and the parking area. Uh, there'll be a group led by the uh, Dragon Boat Club, who's one of our amazing trail adopters, uh, <clears throat> working in Cass Park. This is the Cass Park Bird Garden with the kiosk. Um, shot the other day, this is Priscilla Point. And um, and we will also be working at the Ithaca Overlook as well, um, the Inlet Overlook, which is just adjacent to Priscilla Point, just a little bit south of the Dragon Boat Club. Um, on May 6th, it's statewide, I love my park day, and we'll have another event, um, probably do more mulching, um, fine tuning gardens at that point. Um, so we'll be sending you emails about that for sure. Um, Janelle is helping me out here and she um, tonight with the tech um, and uh, she is our communications coordinator and we'll be in touch with many of you. Um, so the main event tonight, um, we're very excited. Uh, I, uh, my friend Dan Siegel, who owns the Plantsman Nursery and I um, have a <clears throat> Ithaca Native Plant Symposium every March. We did cancel it this year. We do it at the um, Cinemopolis. And those of you that are from Ithaca know that um, it's an area that's under construction and went through some organizational change. So we decided to cancel it this year, but we are gonna do it again next year. Last year we were, so pleased to have Mary Ellen LeMay join us um, to talk about pollen, pollinator pathways. She did a wonderful job, so I thought it would be a nice um, presentation to have her speak about um, the work that she's doing in Connecticut and throughout the Northeast on, on pollinator pathways. And we're pleased to announce we might be their most recent um, member. We just joined last week um, and submitted a bunch of materials and uh, We'll be posting little charming signs that you just showed us tonight actually throughout the waterfront trail that, <clears throat> that announced this um, 
the fact that we are a pollinator pathway. So in just over five years, 300 towns in eight Northeastern states are in various stages of launching pollinator pathways. Our speaker, Mary Ellen LeMay, is a founding member and on the board of directors of Pollinator Pathways Northeast, the Connecticut-based organization that's leading this movement in North, Northeast. Mary Ellen is the landowner engagement director for the Aspetuck Land Trust, a member of Hudson to Housatonic Regional Conservation Partnership, and the State of, New York, State of Connecticut Native Plants Working Group. She received her BS in biology from Fairfield University, an MBA from Fordham, and a master's in environmental management from Yale University School of the Environment. She is also the chairwoman of the Trumbull Conservation Commission, CT certified master wildlife conservationist, and on the board of the Merritt Parkway Conservancy. So please give a, a rousing welcome um, to Mary Ellen LeMay. We'll talk for 45 minutes or so about the work she's doing uh, with Pollinator Pathways Northeast and then um, we will accept some questions at the end. So I'm gonna stop sharing and Mary Ellen, you can um, share your screen and okay. we'll get going. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rick, for that introduction and thank you for inviting me back um, to Ithaca. I've been here twice without actually ever going to Ithaca. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get to come in, in person sometime. Please but, do. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me back, and um, I am going to just uh, reduce the number of people on the side there. Okay, so um, uh, I, t tonight I just wanted to um, go over kind of the the pathway of the pollinator pathway. How it how did this all start? Um, why the time is right for a program like this, and it's an idea really. And um, what has worked over the last uh, five years since it started up in 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, six years as of this February. So, um, and also wanted to share how actually you can do a pollinator pathway in your community. And um, Rick and his team have done this successfully, as he said, as of uh, um, this week, you are our newest uh, member on the pathway. And um, I'm just delighted to be here again and, and um, just kind of share this excitement of, of this phenomenon that has occurred <clears throat> kind of out of nowhere. Um, so my first slide really kind of shows you somewhat of an updated um, map of the Northeast. It's the Pollinator Pathway started as a conservation initiative for that Hudson to Housatonic Conservation Partnership. It was an idea um, of how to do landowner engagement. And, you know, for years we had in the conservation community in, in Connecticut had been talking about uh, connecting properties across um, uh, the state in order to, in the face of climate change, allow for the movement of wildlife and uh, insects and uh, plants as well to move across the landscape. And it wasn't really resonating with people because how can, you can't save all the land, you just can't. Um, and land trusts were stuck with a bunch of fragmented parcels. And it wasn't until the idea of the pollinator pathway emerged um, by one, one woman, Donna Merrill, um, who happened to be reading an article about the V Highway in Oslo, Norway. And that was uh, an idea where a, a woman in uh, Oslo had the, the concept to connect all of the city areas, uh, the, the balconies, uh, potted plants along the street um, to get a bee highway went along the city of Oslo. And Donna Merrill said, I wonder if that would work here. Um, so she started doing it as a project and it seemed to work well. So um, actually the numbers that, uh, that I had given Rick a couple of weeks ago have since changed. As of today, we have over 332 communities. That's you know either towns or watershed organizations in 16 states. Um, and over 6,000 individuals have joined since the formal launch in 2017. 
And so what we found is that um, by creating a pollen pathway, um, we're encouraging people to go to the towns next door and the communities next door. And you, can't, you cannot light another's path without brightening your own. That seemed to be um, resonate with us about how this pathway is uh, going across the landscape so quickly. So when this began, uh, we in, the, in Connecticut were in um, a situation where we didn't realize that this bill was being worked on by our state entomologist uh, called an act concerning pollinator health. And there were two parts to this bill. One was restricting the use of neonicotinoids um, by the public. Uh, and the other was um, having the Department of Transportation identify opportunities for replacement of our non-native cool seeds and turf grasses along state highways with native plant communities. Now, um, this was this just so happened to be approved at the same time that Donna Merrill was thinking about the Bee Highway in Oslo, Norway. And you know, these two storms just converged at the same time. And uh, it, it seemed like a right time to, to begin this conversation in Connecticut. So the town of Wilton is was the very first pollinator pathway. That's where Donna Merrill lives. Within two years, we had uh, all of these towns in Connecticut and New York, um, Westchester County for the most part, um, that joined the pollinator pathway. They understood the need for it. And it was a very exciting uh, community outreach opportunity for folks. Um, and so I just got this snapshot today of uh, the Ithaca region. and. This show uh, the pollinator pathway oaks already signed up in our uh, region, which is really exciting because this happened just since um, you know the last talk that that uh, that Rick had on pollinators. So um, you are definitely on your way, and uh, it's exciting to see you know in another year or so how many butterflies you'll have um, in in the Ithaca region. Um, after we launched the pathway uh, in 2017, Connecticut Magazine um, did an article on this initiative, and we were just totally surprised uh, that you know it actually ended up being the centerfold of Connecticut Magazine. So it was really nice that all of us 50 somethings uh, in the centerfold of Connecticut Magazine. Uh, but this is Donna, who had the initial idea about the pollinator pathway, um, and. That's me and the state entomologist who wrote the law, the pollinator protection law, um, and Louise Washer, who basically managed the Norwalk River watershed, and she brought the pollinator pathway right down the watershed. Um, so this was our claim to fame getting in Connecticut Magazine. But I like this slide because it gives you an idea that the pollinator pathway is really just an idea and it's shared among existing conservation organizations. It's truly a network. Um, so there's two uh, kind of management arms to it. One is the board of directors, and that's made up of most of us who were on the initial um, 2017 uh, launch. And we manage the website, um, generate educational materials. We connect to new towns and neighboring towns and give presentations for new towns like, like tonight. But the beauty of the pollinator pathway is the fact that it's mostly managed at your town level by existing organizations. Um, you do the, the talks and pop-ups, you manage the volunteers, you do the outreach to uh, homeowners, maybe offer home visits, act as a fiscal sponsor. Maybe there's a 501c3 up there that can manage grants for the pollinator pathway. Um, and you manage your own page on the pollinator pathway, which I think was just created for you. So. The beauty of it is each town adds their own flavor uh, because nobody knows the Ithaca region better than you. Uh, and that's what makes this a success. And the reason uh, that we think that it's working is because you have the power of a charismatic character, like a butterfly <clears throat> on our logo. And that opens doors to start community conversations, kind of like um, uh, our panda bear. Um, it it's it resonates. It's it's something that ha, that is a symbol that people will recognize. Um, it's a positive message. Um, climate change is something that's just so overwhelming. We feel like we can't do anything about it. Um, and when we do 
make some headway, uh, policies change that turn us back, you know, another five years. So it's very frustrating. But this is something that can be done locally, um, and it definitely makes a difference. Um, it's important because the pollinator pathway uh, is a simple message and it's affordable or even free. No big costs unless you, you know, want to do fundraisers to pay for plants. Um, it's a decentralized local control. Again, as I said before, um, it's grassroots. And people need an excuse to reach across boundaries and to talk within your town, across town lines to the town next door, and across state lines, which is what we're seeing happening now. So it's working because it's a way to take action at home and to join a wave of others taking action. And we share from each, share um, successes from each other. And it truly um, works because if you plant these native plants, they will come. Uh, and it's almost like instant gratification and that's what gets people hooked. So Pollinator Pathway tapped into what's already here. There's an anxiety about the sharp decline in bee and bird and butterfly populations. The New York Times and um, other newspapers and magazines have done a great job in the last um, half a decade just really providing the science of what's going on and the impact of climate change. So, you know, the anxiety is there. Uh, people are already primed to try and do something. Um, all of the research that's shown in the past few years is the bee populations, the butterfly populations are down, um, and it's and it's significant. Uh, it's very very worrisome. You know, we used to get uh, um, bugs um, on our front windshield as we drove in the summer. We don't see that anymore. I mean, that's a pretty good indication of of the decline and why it's happening. And this is Doug Tallamy's slide um, that he allowed um, us to use. And, and he says out of the top six causes of this insect decline, pesticides, habitat loss, non-native ornamentals, invasive species and security lights and climate change, the top five are completely within our control. These are five things that we can control on our own uh, properties, in our own parks, um, in our own region. Climate change is, you know, the big kahuna that uh, is the collective impact of the positive things that we, we can do. But on an individual basis, it's these top five that we can control. Uh, and people say, well, why can't insects and the biodiversity that depends on them be sustained in our parks and our preserves? I work for a land trust. <laughs> we have um, over 2,000 acres of, of land that's preserved and protected. How come that's not enough um, to keep the biodiversity going? And this is the reason, because our landscape is permanently fragmented. Um, so it's up to us now to weave it back together with pollinator pathways um, or green corridors or whatever you want to call them. Um, we can begin to weave this back together. Um, and I liked this slide from Doug Tallamy. Um, I just, this was a new one um, that I just added. And I like this because it says the, we the Western settler mindset was I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. And I really see this shift uh, over the last, um, you know, six or seven years, there's been a change. And, and I'm seeing it from state to state, from town to town we feel um, ready to acknowledge the earth and nature, and we have obligations to protect it and steward, steward it. We no longer have rights to destroy it. So this is an analogy that um, I always liked. Doug Tallamy uses this, and he let me uh, share his, uh, his uh, Persian rug analogy. So David Quammen is um, an author a science and nature author, and he compares ecosystems to a Persian rug. And this is an untouched ecosystem. Man has not uh, had any impact here. It's whole, it's connected. You see the patterns, everything's working uh, together and you can identify it. And then we came in and cut it to pieces. We fragmented it. This represents the fragmented landscape. Um, we, we, 
cut up the wilderness uh, and made our neighborhoods, we made our farms, um, and this is what we're left with. So people get depressed because they think, well, this is never going to look like that rug again. Um, nothing that we can do to make it turn back. And the reality is by connecting our private properties and our yards, we can reconnect the rug. It's not gonna look like it used to look. It's not like it looked uh, even 200 years ago, but it is the best that we can do now. And they're finding that these fragmented habitats, once they are connected with what is like connective tissue, um, when we change the way we, we create our backyards, when we use ecologically balanced uh, methods, um, we can reconnect this landscape. And um, the author E.O. Wilson, uh, his, his theory is that we need to protect half earth, half earth has to go back to nature. And you immediately think, well, we can't protect half the earth. It's not possible because we're here. This is the way to do it. Integrating the private properties with the protected properties, uh, we can get to half earth protection. And the way we do this is to add more native plant life, more biological diversity, biodiversity equals more light life. So you look at, let's say this is a, a, a farm or a house that's all lawn, you're gonna have a very limited um, very low biological diversity on that property. But as you add and you heal the landscape and you begin to add riparian buffers, you add more clusters of trees. Yeah, it's still fragmented, but you're seeing a more of an increase in the biological life uh, of that property. And then at the top, the more trees, the, the um, converting more into um, riparian buffers, you're gonna get a, a much stronger wealth of biological diversity and the food chain will begin to heal itself. And it all comes from the plants, native plants. When we don't have them, uh, this is what we get. When we begin to add them, it starts to heal the web of life. Um, and this cross section I think is important to understand because when we're trying to connect the landscape for a movement of species across the landscape, um, when the land looks like this, where there's physical diversity, um, where you have uh, cliffs and ridges and swamps and marshes, um, the more physical diversity also equals biological diversity. And areas that are protected, landscapes that are protected or preserves typically have this. They have the ups and downs and they have the wetlands and the highlands. Um, this is called a resilient landscape. So even as the climate changes, um, this landscape will hold most of the biodiversity no matter how much the climate changes because it allows species to naturally distribute themselves and to keep our region resilient. So the pathways in the corridors are trying to get these species to move towards this resilient landscape. And when we think about connected corridors, this is down in my neck of the woods in Connecticut. We have uh, um, the Hudson Highlands, the Litchfield Hills. These are the resilient landscapes that I just mentioned. These are the uh, untouched landscapes, very wooded uh, core central forest. Um, and then you get down to the coastline where it's more developed. This is where the pollinator pathway emerged down here. We needed to create these connections across the landscape to get up to the resilient areas. We also have the Atlantic Flyway along the coast and then our watersheds. Those are always the healthiest um, pathways or corridors for uh, wildlife and insects to move across the landscape. And this just, this image I think just clarifies what it's like to have a flow across the landscape. You know, you may have separate properties. Uh, they need to move, the species need to move north. And the best way to do that is to connect our backyard to allow for this free flow uh, across the landscape. And this illustration, I think it just really helps me to understand what we're doing. These are the fragmented habitats. These are those pieces of Persian carpet. Um, separated species sometimes will just turn around and go back because they can't move across the landscape. 
when we change what we do in our backyards and we begin to um, bring in the native plants and trees and shrubs and create layered habitats, um, that's how you allow for the flow of species across the landscape. Um, this house is um, uh, one that obviously has native grasses with pathways through it, uh, have a lot of native species, and it looks like it backs up to an old tree farm. So this kind of shows that this is a stepping stone across the landscape. Uh, if I were flying over uh, as a bird, I would stop there. Um, I would not stop here or stop here. I would stop there. So this is what we're getting, trying to get people to just make some small changes in their landscape. And this one is one of the most beautiful examples of a stepping stone that I can, uh, that I've seen. So this is Rick Dark. Now Rick Dark is an incredible author, um, landscape architect, designer, um, and he did a lecture for us uh, last year and has allowed um, us to use this aerial shot of his property. This is a stepping stone. I certainly would stop here if I were flying over. It has lawn, but the lawn is a frame. The lawn is a pathway. It's not the whole thing. It frames the native shrubs here. There's mature trees. There's a layered canopy. This is a stepping stone. This is what we're talking about. Um, this is the connective tissue between protected properties. Um, and so, you know, this is just a great example of what can be done. And so to, to wrap up this part of the discussion, what is a pollinator pathway? It is a corridor of public and private properties that provide native plant habitat and nutrition for pollinators. Um, these are the protected lands. These are our backyards. And one by one, we wanna create the stepping stones across the landscape. And with every a household that gets on the pollinator pathway, we begin to connect the landscape, whether it's towns doing this, property owners, they're creating pesticide-free healthy yards and public spaces for pollinators, pets, and families. Um, <clears throat> this is just a, a nice illustration of, you know, there's a variety of pollinators and they all fly um, in different distances. So um, whether it's 500 feet, or 11 miles, uh, it depends on the size of the pollinators. So connecting these gardens along a, a pathway helps uh, no matter how, how big or how small the pathway is. The message for the pollinator pathway is very simple. It's three things. It's rethink your lawn, plant native plants, and avoid pesticides. Um, we have kept it simple. This has always worked uh, for people and rethinking your lawn means reducing the size, um, mowing less, um, possibly using organic land care or lawn care. Of course, planting natives and pesticides. They negatively impact the health of all of us. Um, and so, you know, one a quote from E.O. Wilson, a world without insects is a world without people. They are the beginning of the food chain. And and in order to get the insects, we need the plants. So rethink your lawn, um, could be anything like this entire lawn is clover. I took this picture in Italy at the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican and um, everyone else is taking pictures of the Vatican. I'm taking pictures of the lawn. No, it was not lawn, it was all clover. It was green, there was no irrigation um, and it was beautiful. So if it's good enough for the Pope, I guess it's good enough for the rest of us. Um, if you don't want a whole lawn of, of clover, you can do this. This is a, a friend of mine who just started, uh, her husband started mowing the lawn around these little islands of clover, um, which were just buzzing with life. So they got their lawn and they got these islands. And I thought, gosh, how beautiful this would be to have different types of clover. I know it's not native, um, but it still uh, provides what is needed for um, the pollinators. And then be creative, have your pathway, uh, you know, go through some sedges, which I think just are, are beautiful. These native grasses are really uh, pretty instead of regular lawn. And planting native uh, plants, this is another Doug Tallamy illustration, which I think is really helpful for us to understand that the native plants are the source for all energy that supports life. The native plants are needed by the insects. The native plants are, are needed by the herbivores and the carnivores require, you know, um, 
require the herbivores and this is the healthy food chain without the native plants, um, the whole thing falls down with uh, the insects, especially this is the food source for everything as well. It's kind of like a Jenga game. You know, these are the, these are the Jenga pieces at the bottom. Uh, if those are pulled out, the whole thing falls. Uh, so what we can do and what we have control over is bringing these back into the landscape and then everything else will show up starting with the pollinators. And um, many of you who've maybe read Doug Tallamy, um, he talks about keystone species and they are the 5% of our native plants that make up 75% of the food that drives food webs. Our oaks are the most important native tree. Uh, and this, this is pretty standard from state to state um, all across the country. There's a 5% uh, group of these keystone plants. And if we can get these into our backyards, if we can get these into our parks, um, it will help to attract the insects, attract the pollinators and then get that whole web of life to begin to weave back together. Um, so again, number, uh, number three, avoid pesticides and herbicides. This goes without saying um, for our children and our pets, even if you don't care about pollinators or the birds, uh, I don't know why you would want your child to be exposed to this or you know, your dog having it, those pesticides absorbed into their noses and paws. Um, it just doesn't make any sense for me. So um, I've never used pesticides. I've never had to. And, and it would be great if it was actually spelled right. I just noticed there's an R there. That's weird. <laughs> That's a strange sign. Um, anyway, the pollinator pathway also works because it's a scalable model. Any size garden will work. You can start with pots like they did in Oslo, Norway, and go all the way up to pollinator gardens at um, uh, in your parks, like uh, Rick showed some beautiful pictures of, um, of your park and demonstration sites in front of libraries or town halls or your big restoration sites. And as the size increases, the planning increases complexity and the cost increases. So, you know, there's no um, shame in starting small. And we like to say the pollinator pathway is the starter drug for biodiversity because if you plant, for pollinators and they show up, everything else will show up. If your yard is safe enough for the pollinators, it's safe enough for all the other insects, birds, mammals, pets, families. They are the starting point. And um, I show this is my lamp on my desk. Um, and I have two oak leaves that I collected from my property in the fall that were that look like Swiss cheese. They're filled with holes. Um, and to me, that tells me that I have a really healthy oak out there that's doing its job. Uh, these leaves did their job, the caterpillars ate them. Um, you know, what is it, 300, or, or I guess it's 500 now, 543 species of caterpillars um, uh, are found in oak trees. They're the host for 553 um, species of moths and butterflies. If your oak leaves look like this at the end of the year, you're, it everything is great. Um, you have a really healthy start to uh, a biodiverse uh, landscape. Um, and this is something that 10 years ago, if we had looked at it and said, oh my gosh, something's eating my oak tree. I need to call a tree service and have them spray it. Uh, but now we know that that's not the case. We want these holes. So, now I've gone through the why this is happening, how we did it. So now I'm just gonna share, let's do this, how to start a pollinator pathway in your town. And um, in the Ethica region, you've been um, successful uh, doing this and taking these steps, uh, but it's important to just kind of revisit and understand how um, town by town, you can begin this process. First is convene your team, look at your town get a snapshot of the local nurseries, nature centers, conservation commissions, garden club, master gardeners, watershed associations. This is my town of Trumbull, Connecticut. It's nice to kind of take an inventory or an audit of all of the potential team members that you can have 
for your pollinator pathway in your town. Um, this is uh, New Jersey, the folks around Montclair, New Jersey, they had a whole slew of organizations on their team. And, um, and it's fun to show off the logos for all of these um, team members. So you know when you get a team like this, you're not alone. Could be one person from each one of these organizations, but everybody's on the same page and on the same mission to start the pollinator pathways. Um, the second thing is plan your route, pull your maps out. Maps are so much fun to look at. Um, uh, you can see when you when you when you're beginning to create a corridor through through the town, you may have parks along this corridor. This is a watershed area. This is really nice to um, just look and see where the neighborhoods are where you might want to start a pollinator pathway. What we have found um, in the past few years since we started is that um, rather than have a formal pathway like this, each town just decided that they're on the pollinator pathway. Town of Trumbull, town of Westport, the town of Fairfield, we're on the pollinator pathway. Um, although it is a lot of fun to kind of draw through the maps and, and go across town borders, it's we're finding that um, it's just to, great to have it as an all town initiative. Um, and then again, going across town and state lines, these are, uh, these are half of these folks are in Connecticut, half are in New York. Um, we share tools, we share ideas, but we each add our own flavor to the pollinator pathway. Uh, number three, hold a kickoff event. This is the very first kickoff in 2017. This is Donna Merrill presenting her Wilton pollinator pathway uh, to an audience of folks. Um, and then a couple of months later, an adjacent town had a kickoff um, at a nursery and they got the young people to dress up as bees. And people had wine and cheese and got to um, hear a talk from the, the uh, nurserymen at the uh, nursery, which was great. That was the launch in Darien, Connecticut. Um, number four, engage community members, corporations, partners, town stakeholders and staff. You've got Cornell University there. Um, the Cornell Extension is an amazing um, resource. Uh, and I'm sure you have plenty of um, corporations around that area that have sustainability departments that are filled with young people that are really strong and can dig holes and help uh, to plant native plants. Um, and then engaging your community. This is that crew in New Jersey that had um, the, uh, the, this is of course during COVID when everybody had masks on outside uh, and they launched their pollinator pathway uh, in their town center. Uh, in Montclair. So um, it, it's just been so much fun to watch photos coming in from all over the country of people launching this pollinator pathway that came from one person's idea. Um, and spread the word, uh, have these lectures, um, get onto social media, get into the newspapers. Um, you can do radio shows and podcasts. And this, uh, these brochures, the blueprint for these brochures is on the website. Um, so you could create your own brochure uh, with your own photos in it. So we're trying to make these tools available free. Um, you'd only need to pay for printing costs if you were to do your own brochure. Um, and staying connected. This is uh, what's happened in Ithaca uh, today. You guys are now on the website. Um, you have your own town has its own page. Um, you can list the events for your town. You can order yard, si yard signs on the, um, on the website, and there's resources there that can be shared, handouts, tips for uh, planting containers. Um, and then, so this is an example of the page where you pull down onto pollinator pathway. This is obviously an old picture because we only had four states. Um, but then you pull down, um, this is Connecticut, pulls up Connecticut, then you highlight your town. And then when you highlight your town, then you'll have your own page that you can develop and we'll help you do this. Um, with Jana Hogan, um, who works with us, she manages the website and she'll help you set up um, your own page. And then when it clicks join the pathway, it goes to your, the folks in your team, it goes to your connector people, whoever's running the pollinator pathway in your town. Um, so we're trying to make these tools as easy as possible. These are hand, handouts that are on there that you could print out PDFs, um, how to, you know, rethinking your lawn, 
Um, I would encourage you to work on your own list of wildflowers for pollinators through the season. Uh, this is a great tool for your local natives that bloom from May to October. Um, so go shopping on the Pollinator Pathway uh, website. Uh, keep it affordable. Um, you know, it's it, the maps, the logos, the brochures, um, there it's all downloadable so you if you if you want to use them you can load them uh and print them yourself um another tool that we have is brand new this pesticide brochure uh pesticide free uh care for your yards um a lot of helpful hints in this this can also be printed and then a story map well the story map is is an interactive lecture um it's a way to just go through and it tells you the story of the pollinator pathway and it's something that you could use um, as a presentation like um, I'm doing today. Uh, and it gives you the narrative that goes along with the pictures. Uh, some towns like Newtown, Connecticut set up a, a proclamation, the office of their first selectman. Uh, they signed um, Newtown as a pollinator pathway town. And then the town of Westport, uh, came up with a pledge and a proclamation. Yes, I'd like to be on the Westport pollinator pathway. I agree to do these things. This is my address. Um, uh, put a butterfly on the map um, and I'm gonna buy a sign. Um, so, you know, each, each town's coming up with different um, ways to do this. Um, so this is the pollinator pathway sign. We have metal ones um, there. I'm gonna send uh, some to Rick for him to see what they look like. We have the small one, and then we have a really big one, which would go great into in your parks. So we have different sizes of pollinator pathway um, signs. And you know, the beauty of this is it's a shared idea um, and it's evolving. It came really from the book of Ptolemy. Um, it's organized by mainly people who are already doing this work, um, who understand the importance of native plants, um, and we look to the books by Doug. He has spoken many times for us. Um, we've had the Xerxes Society um, do some talks for us, which, which have been really great. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there to share with folks. And organizing a pollinator pathway is really just listening to people, um, moving them towards taking action and inviting them to show up. What, mat for mo what matters to you and your community. It's all grassroots. It's about meeting so many wonderful people who are like-minded um, and staying positive. And then just show up and become an agent of change in your own yard. Um, you know, we our goal, let's say, is to get rid of these yellow signs and replace them with pollinator pathway sign that says native plants pesticide free on it. Um, there's so many things that you can do um, as a pollinator pathway uh, town that doesn't cost any money. And what um, uh, I'm doing in addition to the pollinator pathway, I'm going to put my land trust hat on top of the pollinator pathway. And um, the research I'm doing in the Aspatuck land trust region, which is um, we're now a five town region, um, is a deeper dive into biodiversity. It's um, uh, when uh, what I've done here is I've overlaid our green corridor on top of the pollinator pathway, and what that means is we're going we're taking a deeper dive to look at um, what else shows up besides the pollinators. What kinds of birds are we seeing now in the next step up the food chain? What kind of mammals are they moving across the landscape in the way that we hope? Um, and we just started an initiative called Proof of Life. Um, which is we're developing with a tool uh, with a, a company in New York called Planet Wild um, and working on a measurement tool to prove that when we're planting these natives after a period of time, we're impacting biodiversity. So uh, that's what the Green Corridor does. And what, what we've added to this, what's different from the pollinator pathway is that the Green Corridor, because we're a land trust, we do land protection in addition to land stewardship. Land stewardship is what we're doing with the pollinator pathway. Um, land protection adds those protected properties. We have 40,000 acres um, that we are 
using as a study um, area to measure biodiversity. And um, within the Green Corridor, we started a pollinator corridor um, with a company in Massachusetts called Landscape Interactions. Evan Abramson is a pollinator designer. Um, he helped us design a 20,000 square foot pollinator habitat in one of our um, nature preserves that has six different habitats. Um, so meadow, wetland, um, a bee lawn, an edge habitat. Um, and this is a uh, courtyard and this is a shade area. So the science is informing the design and then the plants drive the results. We are gonna be measuring pollinators on this site um, over the next three years. So he did a baseline, Dr. Robert Gagier came in, did a baseline of uh, pollinators that are on site. And we hope that in three to five years, we'll see an increase in the number of species. So we want these native plants. The challenge we found after the pollinator pathway launched was that we, it was very hard to get natives, true natives. Um, so that sparked uh, our Connecticut NOFA, Organic Farming Association team, to come up with this concept called the Ecotype Project. Um, and this is the original team that started this now with um, botanists who collected native wild seeds. Um, that's uh, Jordy Elkins right there. Uh, sends the seeds to the organic farmers here at the hickories with, um, with Dina and Sephra. Um, and then it goes to the nursery growers. Like here we have Sal Gilberti, but um, we have other nurseries that are growing these seeds out. Um, and then we, uh, the Aspatuck Land Trust buys them in flats and we sell them in a, at a plant sale. And the first year we did it was 2020, just as COVID hit. Uh, and it has turned into being one of our most successful fundraisers that we've had. We have had six of these native plant sales since this very first one. Um, and at the plant sales, we went from just flats of seven basic species. This is what we started with the initial group with the Joe pie weed and the mountain mint. Um, and then we expanded to these hedgerow kits that included a, a tree and uh, shrubs and other ground covers, um, getting people to understand if you've got a dry sunny area, you can put this hedgerow in. Shady area, this is what goes in. Um, and so we put these kits together. We've had six of these native plant sales um, and uh, we've had over 34,000 native plants, trees and shrubs that have gone into um, our region. And the planting plans are really helpful. Again, these are also on, on the website, on the Pollinator Pathway website. Um, again, this was our first kit that we put together. And we kind of told people, these are the species, this is when, when they, they bloom, and this is what shows up, and this is how you measure out and, and plant the plants. And we were totally surprised when someone sent us a photograph and they had followed the plan exactly with the exact number of species. We put a flat together of 32 plants um, and she planted it and it looks just like the picture. And I couldn't believe it because these normally don't bloom at the same time. So this illustration we knew was not true, but they bloom so closely to each other. The only things that were just coming out now was the Joe pie weed and the um, New York iron weed are in here, but everything else, um, is, is blooming. So it was just amazing to us that the picture looked just like the illustration. We didn't expect that to happen. So it told us we were on the right path. Um, and this is just our, our native plant sale impacts um, for our land trust. And, and it's just increased 20% year over year in terms of sales and customers. It's been amazing. We also, um, uh, through the Pollinator Pathway um, and the Green Corridor have made partnerships with uh, landscapers uh, in our region. Um, many of them are accredited organic land care professionals, so they understand um, the no pesticide plant natives uh, mantra. And again, the unexpected partners, the Department of Transportation stayed true to following their um, the law that came out in 2016, and they started with these conservation areas. And right now they have uh, over 111 sites, probably more now, 
um, of across um, here's 95, um, 91. A lot of the state highways is where they're plant 84, where they're planting um, these native plant habitats. So it's nice to have an unexpected partner like the DOT and then water companies as well, um, partnering with us to uh, encourage the use of native plants, which use a lot less water. And the collective impact is, you know, you can't change what you don't measure. There are so many fabulous tools out there now. I use Seek all the time. There's another one called um, uh, Plant, oh, picture this. Um, and it just helps identify not only plants, but insects as well. Um, these tools are out there, um, use them, and all the data that you collect goes into a central area where they're, they're calculating um, the species that are showing up. So, um, you know, you can't change what you don't measure until you see, you know, you're going from zero uh, on your property, zero pollinators to the next year you have more. Let's see what kind of species you have by using some of these tools. And um, just as I wrap up here, this was a fairly, um, this was from last August, but this was a great article. Um, I would encourage you to look up it. It really validates the work that we're doing, um, which is wildlife gardening. And it gives you a perspective on not only the impact that you're having on native biodiversity, but it's strengthening a social connection to place and to nature and well being. And it's also um, in increasing our personal well being uh, because it's giving us hope uh, and it's giving us action steps that really make a difference. So this was a really kind of a really nice article um, in this journal of the research that validates what we're doing. So again, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. Just stay on course, stay moving forward, and know that you just by what you're adding to your gardens and your parks is ha are having an impact on biodiversity. And all of these photographs were taken in someone's backyard, a very small backyard uh, in Croton on the Hudson, New York. Um, and it was amazing the, the variety of, of creatures that she sees on a regular basis in her very small backyard. And so I liked this definition of courage to wrap up that, um, the world looks to leaders to model courage. And when your passion overtakes your fear, courage emerges. Uh, courage is acting in the face of fear, standing up for the truth, being willing to take a risk and actively making a difference. And to me, that typifies the pollinator pathway because one by one, we connected the people and then the landscape started to connect as a result of that. And we are actively making a difference. So now it's up to you in Ithaca uh, to explore and to be inspired by the changes in your backyard. And so that's all I have for tonight. Um, this is my email address. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. I encourage you to go on the pollinator-pathway org um, website. That's where all the goodies are. Um, and you can go to the Aspetuck Green Card or website too, where I have some also some new planting plans as well. So, um, so that's all. I hope I am right on time. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, thank right. you very much for letting me uh, talk about my favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um, thank you. That was great, Mar Mary Ellen. We appreciate it. Um, so we can, we have a few minutes to take questions. And I think the best way to do it is to um, put them in the chat. We'll have everybody put them in the chat. We've already got a couple that I'll read uh, one at a time for you. And then the other thing I wanted to let people know is that um, this talk will be, it is being recorded and we will put it up on our YouTube page within the next week or so. And um, once we have it up on the page, we will send everybody an email with the link so that um, the people who were unable to join us today that registered um, can still see it and people who came late can see what they missed. 
and then you can share it with everybody that you think might be interested as well. Uh, let's see, our first chat question is um, wondering about spongy moth caterpillars. When you were talking about the oak trees, um, <laughs> you mentioned um, how great it is that there was a wide variety of uh, caterpillars, but um, but somebody said, I don't really want the spongy moth caterpillars. <laughs> Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, so the, so um, those are the gypsy moth caterpillars that we all, you know, are, are worried about. Um, and gosh, I've seen so many um, recommendations for people to cut the branches off and set them on fire and put them in gasoline. And um, I, I've actually found, um, I, I've not seen them on, on my oaks. I usually see them on younger trees or um, some beaches or some uh, smaller trees. And one of the best things that you can do is um, the nest, if you can actually reach the, the, um, the nest, which is just kind of like a big web, and you just take a stick and go through it and open it up, and the, the birds will come and eat um, the caterpillars uh, out out of those um, nests. So if you help them, they'll even they'll even eat them. There are just a couple of specific birds that will actually eat the gypsy moth caterpillars because they're spiky; they have spikes on them. Um, but for some of the other, like the fall webworm moths. Um, you know, there uh, you you again just open that nest and you will have cardinals in there um, eating those caterpillars in no time. So I would never spray um, because you might want to. You're thinking you're targeting just the gypsy moths, and you're taking down you know an entire ecosystem of 500 other good species. Um, so when you create a more biodiverse backyard, you have more carnivores. You have more things that will eat um, these other. Um, maybe the 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 moths and and some of the the bad insects so you get a balanced uh, ecosystem if you have more um a biodiverse backyard so uh so i would just open the nest with a stick and let let the birds have at it great thank you um i will speak to one question somebody asked about what youtube page it is um we uh friends of stuart park has a youtube page and um i don't have the exact link right in front of me, but I'll put it in the I'll put it in the chat. But also, if you just Google Friends of Stuart Park YouTube, it will come up. Um, we have all of the talks that we've had in the past on there, as well as videos of um, people talking about the playground. Um, Rick did a great presentation last year about the Cuga Waterfront Trail. Um, all of those are up on our YouTube page, and we will also share that link with you once we get this one up in about a week. Um, the next question is somebody asking if you could define herbicide. Um, talk about how there's no herbicides. Oh, okay. So an herbicide is um, is a synthetic product usually that um, is a weed killer, kills weeds. Um, and so... Um, for example, Roundup is an herbicide. Uh, it kills uh, it kills weeds and it kills everything really. But um, when you when you, if you hear somebody talk about pesticides as a general category and they don't mention herbicides, herbicides are naturally under the umbrella of pesticides because they're considering weeds as pests. So pes pesticides, we're telling you not to use pesticides. That also includes. Um, um, not using herbicides as well. So it's, you know, it'll kill herbicide, kills herbs, kills weeds. That's what that is. All right. The next question is, um, uh, where does one get a plant list for a private garden um, that doesn't want grasses everywhere, um, like the traditional uh, lawn and green space? Oh, so a local, um, a list of of natives for the area I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, leave, I'll leave that up to Rick to <laughs> work on that um I would really suggest and you're you're in the home ground of Cornell right there your home your Cornell extension they will have that list for you um and you could probably take the list of natives for this area and, and put it into a nice um uh you know a nice chart that shows where the when they bloom. So this way you'll have a sequence of blooms all year uh, with your native plants. Actually, that that one that I showed um, was done by our state entomologist. She did that for us. One side is um, 
the uh, perennials. The other side, she did uh, trees and shrubs for pollinators. So it's a two-sided um, thing. So it's a great project for somebody in your area to work on your native, um, your native plants. Yeah, I have a, um, well, Dan Siegel of the Plantsman Nursery. Um, hmm. Many of you, I'm sure, who are here shop there. Um, they don't exclusively grow natives, but that's their main niche. And they do grow them from seed primarily. And um, <clears throat> they have lists available and, and they have very, um, I don't know, engaging literary descriptions on all of the plants that mm -hmm. I think are fun, really fun to read. Um, so that is a great source. The Cuga Bird Club has a um, native plants for native birds um, book that is a really nice, a nice local book. It's not um, comprehensive, but it has a small list that is actually kind of manageable to kind of you know, see it and understand it without having to spend three months reading it. So I think that's a, a nice, um, a nice resource and they, they, you can find that on their website certainly. Um, I mean one inter interesting distinction that I should mention that might be getting a bit geeky for some of you but um, something that we talk about a lot at the Native Plants Symposium um, and I think Mel addressed it in her presentation about uh, this ecotype project. Um, so a lot of the um, native so-called native plants that you would buy at a typical nursery they're cultivated varieties, they're asexually propagated, they're probably grown in Oregon in a very traditional nursery model, and then they're shipped across the country um, and sold, um, um, you know, in various kind of, um, and I think if you grow them in that way, um, you can kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you can basically, uh, keep that variety intact and try to market it. It's a good marketing tax. So what Dan does and more nurseries that are truly ecologically based and regionally based is to collect seeds locally um, that are open source pollinated and then grow them from seed. And then when you bring that out into your landscape, they should be adapted to your region or provenance is sort of a technical term. And then, um, and then interact with the environment that's there. So I think it's really important to distinguish. It's kind of like, you know, local versus organic. Sometimes we get organic food that comes from Chile or from Mexico. And um, it's really important to distinguish between um, what is called native and really what is truly native and of the region and understand how it's grown. So that, that's something that... Um, um, they're tuned into it, the plantsmen, and not too many nurseries are around here. So I think uh, it's an important resource for those that are interested in this topic. More questions? Oh. Yeah, um, I have some comments that kind of are all related that I think you could mm -hmm. speak to. Um, first of all, um, we uh, have, oh, sorry, I'm gonna go back up in my comments. Um, Somebody just thanking you for your wonderful work um, that uh, you've made it really easy to follow the plants with the templates and the toolkits. And then somebody else was asking what there are plans for expanding the existor pollinator pathway in Ithaca area. And then others spoke to that. Um, uh, Kate Dickin at Cornell is spearheading pollinator pathway group there. There's a listserv, which I don't know if you're on yet, Rick, but we need to get on there. I'm not um, and we've got the email for that. That is kld12 at cornell.edu. That's kld12 at cornell.edu. That's also in the chat if you want to find it. Um, and then uh, um, people are talking about... Um, or said that uh, in the town of Ithaca, they did a pollinator survey in March so they could get a better picture of the pollinator gardens that are already existing in the area. And um, Linda was saying that uh, they're hoping the town of Dryden will do that too. Um, the Cornell Botanic Gardens has their native plant pollinator workshop. Um, and they... Uh, Last year, they included seed plantings for people to take home. 
Finger Lakes Native Plant Society is another one um, that has advice on collecting seeds as well. Um, and uh, Margaret is here in the chat. She's a master gardener um, with uh, Cooperative Extension and um, they're all on board for this, she says, and, uh, and has another listserv um, that's pollinator-pathway-l at list.cornell.edu. That is in the chat if you want to join that. And, um, and uh, Sally asks if we might be able to put a list together of um, good local sources. And I think that we could do that. We can get together a list like that and um, including all this information from the chat. And then when we send out the email to everybody about um, the uh, presentation being put up on YouTube, we'll um, include all of that information as well. Do you wanna to speak to that anymore, Rick? No, I'm just pleased to see all of this um, activity going on that I had no idea was happening. So that's great. It's great. <laughs> it's really yeah, great. it's great. That happens all the time. People are uh, just so excited about it. Um, it's nice to you know be able to reconnect regionally, um, and then you know continue to have programs and lectures and garden tours and gar plant sales and uh, it's just so much fun to see this. Uh, how this is progressing in so many directions all over the country now, which is wonderful. Yeah. So, um, so bravo to everybody in this, uh, in the Ithaca area. This is great. Very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you so that's much. It. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah, I think the, um, the beauty of this, well, one of the beauties of this concept, I think is that it is, it's really pretty accessible. Um, and, um, you know, it's the kind of thing where you just need to do it. And um, that's what we like. So that's great. Um, and I think that's kind of in the spirit of what you're talking about. I, I do want to say to those that really want to dive into this more deeply, and, and those that do probably have already looked at Doug Tallamy's work, but we did have him speak at the conference a couple of years ago with you, uh, Mel. and. Um, he just continues to reframe, dig deeper, just um, refine his story. He's very engaging. His books are great. Um, his presentations are even better. Um, but if you're into this, I would really research Doug Palamy and um, get his books. They're, they're wonderful. So um, that's certainly something that you've clearly studied, Mel, and I think he's a, he's a, a real inspiration fan. for this movement. Sure. I'm actually a, considered a stalker now. I'm you are. Okay. <laughs> I need to let you let you borrow, which is wonderful. So and you give him the credit that he deserves. So it's great. So, um, well, if that's if that's all we have, then um, thank you so much, Mel. We really appreciate you taking the time and spreading the word. Pleasure. And um, <clears throat> I hope I can get down to see some of your some of your work in person in Connecticut sometime, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, come to Ithaca of... for real sometime. I will. <laughs> I absolutely will. I want to go to that park. <laughs> yeah, Thank you course. for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for coming and um, we will see you down the road on the trail. Thank you. <laughs> great. Thank you. Have a good night.